so, uh, so Jesus was uh, coming back from the trip, and he's coming down the road, and uh, he's got a lot of people following. And uh, the chief tax collector, Zacchaeus, has heard about Jesus. He, he wants to see him. And uh, but being a short man in stature, you know, he because of the crowd cannot cannot see Jesus. So he runs ahead and climbs up in the sycamore tree there and uh, so he can get a look at Jesus. And Jesus comes by and sees Zacchaeus up in the tree and he says, uh, Zacchaeus, hurry down. Uh, I must go to your house today. And so hearing this, you know, Zacchaeus comes down quickly and uh, <clears throat> You know, they're, they're they're going on their way there, and, and the crowd begins to mutter and complain. You know, he's going to be the guest of the sinner. Well, Zacchaeus speaks up and he says, uh, "You know, I, I'll, Lord, I'll uh, anybody I've robbed, I'll pay back four times the amount, and I'll take half of what I own and I'll give it to the poor." And Jesus looks at him and says, "Salvation has come to this house today because you too are a son of Abraham. Uh, because the Son of Man came to seek and to save." That which was lost. And this is a true story of the Word of God. So now, y'all know the drill. Y'all probably get tired of this. <laughs> but like Jeff said, repetition in the process, we feel like is definitely a key. So just take some time now and retell the, the story of Zacchaeus. <laughs> All right, guys, this, by the way, this is the first command. This is one of the uh, first of the commands of Christ. So it's found in Luke 19, 1 through 10. Uh, we'll be in this book right here, the, the book we give you, the little the sword method on the front. So that's, if you'll flip over and find the command. But go ahead and do what we've been doing as far as, you know, doing the sword method and all that. Just go ahead and do that. He just did He just Jesus said, you don't know one who has left home or wife or brother or sister. He was offered that the other guy did it. He was offered that first. All right, so uh, first of all, what do you like about this story? It's okay to show. <laughs> Jeff didn't sing the song. <laughs> Jeff didn't sing the song. Okay. I was born by the river. Yeah. 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 Come on. Yeah. And a little town called Bethlehem. Yeah. 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 Rapid obedience. Zacchaeus like climbed a tree up, but God's the one that sent Jesus by the tree because he could took another route and not even came by the tree. If you do what God tells you to do, he's going to prepare whatever needs to be done to get it done. But I could go out here and climb this tree up be looking for Jesus, but if God don't send Jesus by that tree, I just climbed the tree for getting a little exercise. <laughs> God provides for us. <laughs> All right. So, um, so then, uh, what does this what does this story tell us? Kind of, he kind of hit on it there. What does this story tell us about Jesus or God? If you take a step forward, you need to say, "Yeah, that's right." He'll do his part if you do your part. <clears throat> No matter how small we are, he sees us. <laughs> or how hidden we think we may be. That's good. That's right. Our evil. Okay. That's good. I find a joke. Zakia fell short of the glory of God. Fell short. Oh. Mr. Collins, did you? Anything else about Jesus or God, then? <laughs> All right, let's move on to, to Zacchaeus. What, what, what does it tell us about Zacchaeus? What was... He realized he had cheated people and he was willing to go back and to repay his wrongdoing. Right. So he, he realized his sin. Mm -hmm. uh, what else about Zacchaeus? Zacchaeus used to love money than anything. That's the purpose of living. And now after he hit Jesus, he changed. Totally he, changed. Jesus changed his whole, whole outlook, didn't he? 
He was so anxious to see Jesus that he climbed a tree so he could see. That's right. Most people would stand right there on the ground. Right. Kind of going back to the simple woman, you know, willing to do whatever it took just to get that glimpse of Jesus. That's good. He was not embarrassed to go climb the tree because that probably, uh, yeah, yeah, for him to do that is like (coughs) that's humility. That's right. He showed humility by climbing the tree because that's probably. Man of his, I mean, he was the chief tax collector. And he's up here climbing the tree, so yeah, definitely humility. Anything else about Zacchaeus? Sure. Right. What about uh, what, what about the crowd? What does it tell us about the crowd? She's a judgmental. Judgmental. Yeah, they were definitely judgmental. Anything else? Pretty much sums them up, don't you? Just quick to judge. All right, what about uh, sins to avoid? All of them. All of them. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely need to avoid all sins. What, what? The money was his focus, and he was hoarding the money. Instead of taking his wealth to help people, it was all for himself, selfishness. So greedy, selfishness, good, good. Yeah, they have sins here. All right, what about promises? Repent and be born again. Repent and be born again. That's exactly what happened to Zacchaeus because he said, Somebody will come to his house today. That's right. So he repented. You repent, you'll be saved. Be born again. All right, commands to obey. Invite Jesus in. Invite Jesus in. All right, what else? Correct your wrongs. Correct your wrongs. Mm-hmm. Give all to the Lord. Give all to the Lord. That's good. Be willing to do whatever it takes. That's a what about example to follow. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we do that same thing, no? That's good. Be a doer, not only a hearer. That's very good. Be a doer. They yeah, said something at this table that was interesting. That was uh, image. The image that, that Zacchaeus represented after his conversion. Right. And that was the image that Christ projected, even in Genesis, going back to it. You are created in my image, in my likeness. That's good. Right, so in this story, who do you identify, identify with? Depends on what day of the week it is. <laughs> What's that? Depends on what day of the week it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, let's, let's move forward with the Repent and Believe lesson here. And uh, Somebody want to look up Mark 1.15? Verse 15 on? Yeah, just, just 15. Okay. Uh, Jesus came preaching the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Repent and believe in the gospel. All right. So, in this story of Zacchaeus that we just looked at, in Zacchaeus' case, what does repent mean to Zacchaeus? It means it. Change your life. He had the same standard as the rich young ruler. Nothing. He'd come by faith in God's grace and Jesus Christ. The gospel. And what did he do? He, he came. <coughs> Immediately. But he came with nothing in his hand. The rich young ruler came with everything in his hand. That's right. And he didn't he make it. He met the need in the community. He gave half of the church and money. So he accepted Christ and he went out and ministered to the community. That's right. So he basically went from being greedy and wanting all the money to turning around and doing exactly the opposite. So he changed uh, from being greedy, selfish, looking out for zip number one to, you know, doing exactly the opposite of that. And that's trying to help pay back and, and give to the poor. So he changed, okay? He turned away from his sin. Uh, so for believe. 
what a believe mean for Zacchaeus? Trust in Jesus. That's right. So he, just by getting that glimpse of Jesus, it caused him to, you know, change his, change his whole world around. You know, he, he repented from his sins. He believed in Christ, and, and that showed in his actions. Okay. So uh, now we're moving on to the why. Uh, why should it, why should we repent? Since we our sins and turn from them. Then we're going to continue to. So we have to acknowledge what that sin is. Tell God, you know, this is my sin and I'm turning from it so I can move forward. Right. And in the verses of scripture we have here are the same ones we kind of have already done just a little bit ago. We have Romans 3.23. No, I'm saying I think well. I know we're gonna we're not gonna make you. But when I when we walked through the Romans road, I we had you read it right, and then pair it up and retell it, and then explain back to it what what explain back what it meant. That's what you do right here. Okay, I'm, we're not gonna. Uh, I'll tell you what. Just for the sake of practice, just so you see it here, let's do. Um, Assurance of salvation. Let's just say we walk through um, all of that. Um, so you, you would pair up, walk through Romans 3.23, pair up, walk through Romans 6.23, pair up, go through Romans 10, 9, and 10, just like we did already. Um, but just for the sake of moving on, we won't do that to you. But um, let's do this one here. Let's pair up, read it, put it in your own words, and then discuss it. And then discuss it as we do. First John. John one nine and uh, wrong John, John ten twenty eight. Okay, so so just uh, yeah, what he said. <laughs> Pair up with somebody, read it, read it out loud, and then put it in your own words. Let's bring it back together here. So uh, assurance is what we're talking about here. As you see, what First John one nine, somebody. Somebody read that for me, and then, and then we'll have somebody else put, you know, tell me what you think it means in your own words. First John 1 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Okay. Somebody put that in your own words. You have to ask for it. You have to ask for it. And once you ask for it, what? God will do his part. We just agree with Him in our heart. If we agree with God, he picks us up and cleans us up. Right. Yes. Exactly. No, is that, is that he something? the same thing he's saying. I just did that, but tomorrow, I, man, I slipped up and I said a cuss word at work. Now what? Well, he cleansed us all. Uh, so it's all good. He wants you to know. Right. But it's already been taken care of. It's already been taken care of. That's right. So there's nothing I can do to earn it. It's just asking for it. He gives it to us. And then I'm good. You know, am I going to mess up again? Sure. But it's all under the blood. I, that's one of the things with the, one of the homes I was in, Nick and Kayla's home, uh, you know, week in, week out, I, I, I was telling stories, and I was I was just watching Nick, and, and Nick was, man, within himself, he was he was battling. You know what I'm saying? And, and it came down to the week, and, and we did this lesson, and I said, I said, Nick, man, I'm going to be real with you. I said, what's, what's keeping you from giving you life to Christ? Man? And he said, uh, he said, well, I still got a problem with, uh, with cussing at work. I get around my buddies at work, and I get to <laughs> telling jokes or, you know, just getting in the, in the flow of the conversation, and I, you know, I start, I start cussing. You know. And sometimes I, I notice a girl out, out in both place, and I said, man, she, she, she looks good, so I got a problem with lusting. And uh, so, uh, you know, that's when I had to begin to explain to him, hey, man, you're not going to get to a place where you're going to say that you're never going to do those things. <laughs> you know, you're, I'm, I'm not good enough. You're not good enough. So, so we, you know, that's where this this lesson comes in. We got to make them realize that we have that assurance once we ask Christ. You know, give your life to Christ. Let Him start taking care of those, the cussing and the and the lusting and the whatever else you, you're dealing with. So, so there's that. Uh, John 10:28. Somebody read that for me. And give them eternal life, and they will never perish ever. No one will snatch them out of my hand. Okay. So I put that in your own words. 
When saved, always saved. When saved, always saved. Yeah. The Baptist doctor there. <laughs> mine is always mine. Well, there again, you know, it's just, it's just that assurance. Yeah, you know, that that's liberty. Is. That's not license. Thank you. That's good. Once, once we're, we belong to him, if we've truly committed ourselves to him, there's nothing uh, that can snatch us out of his hand. Uh, so that's good there. <clears throat> A lot of people have doubt about salvation assurance, mm -hmm. and usually the good example is like your children. If they they act bad, they commit a crime, they're still your children. Mm -hmm. You know, doesn't matter what, what they did, they still belong to you. <coughs> so if you really belong to God in the very beginning, as you say, you know, really re uh, born again, you still belong to Him. Yeah. But you don't willfully to go do what's wrong. And if you practice, if you practice in sin, then you're not sincere. I don't think the person was really born again. Yeah. You do not practice sin or premeditate. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think you will have a love of sin. You just always will have the struggle of sin. And uh, you will sin less and less until the perfect day that when you see Christ, you know, but uh, you, you don't have the enjoyment anymore because of the Holy Spirit. You, you will still fail. That's why we needed God. I mean, I, I just think that you you just, you will turn to God right away. You know, when you sin, you don't have the enjoyment. You will go straight to confession and asking God to forget. But before, you don't even confess it. You just think it's okay. So the confession is a continuum. You know. Well, like I said, this this here, this is the first command, and, and basically, at this point, in most of the situations I've been in, in these homes, you know, uh, we've been through the seven stories of hope. You know, at this point, we're we're, we're starting to, uh, like Jeff likes to say, Jesus in, in the scripture, he was always quick to ask for a decision. And so at this point, you know, we're, we're asking for a decision. You know, we're trying to get to that point where we're, we're getting a little bit deeper with them begin to you know continue that discipleship process with, the, with these commands and asking for that decision and uh, uh, in the homes that I'm in right now I just want to tell you, you briefly a little bit about what's been going on you know Nick and Kayla they were the the home I got into and, and I visited with them and they said you know uh, we've been married only a short time and we've been talking about getting in church but Nick said uh, we don't need to go to church around here because there's nothing but, but hypocrites you know and uh and so I, you know, which was fine with me because I told him, I said, I'm not, I'm not here to invite you to church. I'm here to invite you to Jesus. And I said, I, I'm just trying to uh, build some relationships in this community, uh, get some Bible study groups started at home. I said, was that something you'll be interested in? And they right away said yes. And so, we, you know, like I said, we went through the, the seven stories of hope. And just each week I was trying to take them that one step closer to Jesus through, through his word, through the stories in his word. And, and, and man, it, the process worked. You know, it, it was each week they were going out and they were – and he invited his brother, Dustin, who Jeff mentioned a little bit last night. And Dustin was agnostic and uh, brought him and his girlfriend in, and, and they've been there ever since. And, and it, through a process, of just like I said, I didn't sit there and debate him about what he believed. I just tried to take him one step closer to Jesus, you know, just tell him those stories. And, and it wasn't long. I think it was the very first week even. Uh, he said a prayer, you know, to a guy that he wasn't sure he believed in, you know. <laughs> uh, but, but just taking him at one step and... And man, Dustin's uh, right on the verge of coming to Christ. He's uh, came to the church service uh, last week, and man, really enjoyed it. And said he'd definitely be back. He's been talking to his mom, even though he's not made a decision yet. He's already been talking to his mom and dad about about what's going on and and, and all that. But uh, I said all that to say um, what my plan is for you know, so y'all can kind of see how this process works. You know, Nick and Kayla have both made a decision for Christ. And so now my, my, my job now is I've started turning it over to them. The past two weeks, they've led the, the, the study in their home. And so I'm going to continue to let them lead. But you're the, there with them. I, yeah, I am there with them. So I'm, I'm assisting them. You know what I'm saying? What we try to use is what's called the model strategy. Model, assist, watch, and lead. Uh, but the leave still means to lead. You know, uh, you're still you know kind of keeping in touch with them, doing some sharp iron sharpening iron. You're still kind of working with them but but I'm pushing them now to try to get into a home themselves you know 
And even once they go into a home, I'll probably, you know, maybe go with them for a few weeks and just kind of be there to, to watch them and making sure that they're doing things. You know, just kind of keep that accountability uh, firsthand. And then at some point, you know, I'll probably step away from that group and let them do it, but I'll still keep in touch with them. I may meet with them once a week or once a month just to say, hey, how's it going, you know. Uh, the same thing with Rebecca. You know, Rebecca was in her home, and, and she right away, I mean, even though she wasn't even, now she told me she was a believer, uh, but but turned out, you know, just through doing this same process, carrying her one step closer to Jesus, she realized she had never made that decision, you know. Uh, and, but, but she was out the whole time going out and sharing these stories at her, at her, at her job. And it's kind of funny, because she was a, she was kind of a, I don't know, she was a man hater kind of thing. She she worked with a bunch of men. She was real angry with her boss because he he didn't think women could do the same things men could do. I mean, so this was what I was hearing every week. But just as the Lord began to change her heart, you know, that became less and less. And then and then we did this lesson, the repent and believe lesson that night, and she said, Hey, I need to, I need to nail nail this down. And she gave her life to Christ. And so now I'm doing the same thing with Rebecca. She started leading the lessons, and, and so I'm assisting her with that, pushing her to get out and, and get into that home with somebody in her life that's far from God, and then using this same process, you know. So, I think that was probably a little bit longer than what I should have went with that, but uh, <laughs> anyway, so, so that's that's the, the, the process I'm using as far as trying to show you the whole picture of what this looks like, you know, reaching out to people far from God, getting in their homes, letting the Holy Spirit do His work, and then challenging them and training them to do this same process. So. Cool. Anybody have any questions for Clint? I'd like to make a comment on the people who are for the church because of the hypocrites in there. And I always, I even have the school, t Sunday school teachers say, I'm just going to quit going to church. You say, what? They're Sunday school teachers. But I say, look at Jesus, hypocrites at that time to the Pharisees and all that. Jesus continued to go every week to synagogue. went every week and there's no better place for the hypocrites to be than a church who knows they might you know be willing to open their ears up and accept Christ hear the truth you say you won't go to church when it comes to the hypocrite oh yeah a lot of people say that's a lot of you go buy your gasoline huh? mm -hmm. yeah you go buy your gasoline for your car unfortunately yeah what, what makes you think that guy ain't a hypocrite you go buy your food at the grocery store? I didn't say that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, he said you don't argue with him every time. No. I don't either, but I asked him a question. I said, would you like bologna sandwiches? The guy down there selling that bologna sandwich you like so much is a hypocrite. Hypocrite is you go down and you buy a bologna sandwich. We're probably all, we're probably all hypocrites. And if you want to go to heaven, you're going to have to go in there and get to the church, but all them hypocrites are fine out the way to hell, baby. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, let, me, let me ask you this. We, we skipped the, obviously on this one, we skipped the first third because we, we're we trying to, one, just again, get you all catch process. New teaching, you all see a pattern here? How'd you practice it? Yeah, pair up. What, why, why, um, why pair up? Why not just have the whole group discuss it at once? I mean, we could just have everybody in here. Because everybody gets to participate. It makes it more personal. Shy one's hiding. Makes it personal. Everybody gets to participate. Yeah, that's, that, we, we want to try and involve everybody as much as possible because then you're vocalizing these things. And, and one, I think Romans 10, 9 and 10, part of confession is this becomes a normal part of my life. I start sharing these things because we say confess before people we usually think about coming down an altar and confess it, but some of it is, man, I'm just sharing my testimony all the time about what God did in my life. You know, this just becomes a normal part of my life. And so there's an advantage of getting, I call it conquer and divide. And then, you know, then you always got preachers. What do preachers like to do? Preach and talk, right? <laughs> So if I allow a preacher 
If I got 40 people, who's going to talk? The preacher. The preacher. And then the one who's not been a preacher, what do they want to do? I'm going to be real quiet because he's the expert and I'm the, you know, I, I can't talk there. Well, we're trying to create an atmosphere of learning and we want to do that in a home. It doesn't matter if there's seven there, if there's 30 there. We want as many people interacting. Um, one strategy Clint used was he said, you can share something, but you can't share what you said. You have to share what somebody else said. Why, why do that? Listen. See, yeah, it makes you listen. Because if not, then, you know, I, what a, and then if I'm in a hurry and I let you share about what you thought versus you share about what somebody else has thought, which one's going to be shorter? Does that make sense? Someone else thought. Yeah, what you heard somebody else say, because you're not going to talk as much about that. But it's just a way to keep things popping and moving. But yet it also makes you listen to somebody else. Because sometimes we can get caught up and we're thinking about our own thing, but we want them listening to one another. And, and, and some of that's just small group dynamics. But we really try to avoid lecturing. You know, and uh, even, even on this, you know, this... We would probably, I could cover a lot more material if I lectured through all this stuff, but I don't think the process would hopefully, hopefully the process is starting to make sense by now. Um, but I, I think, you know, we could cover a lot more content, but we wouldn't catch process. I think y'all are probably really, really good on content. You guys know a lot about the Bible. You're bright. You can study. You can learn about the Word. You're in good churches. So we're not, that's why we're not really focusing there. You guys have a lot of feel. You got a lot of knowledge on the word. Let me just say one thing. Um, I think you'll be shocked when you get into the homes of people far from God, the good answers they give to you from these stories. You're going to be blown away. They give tremendous answers. Uh, they give very nice interpretations also. It is really, really amazing uh, what folks do in these homes. And so I, I don't hear really far out stuff very often. Um, I hear the really far out stuff on Christians' Facebook sites. <laughs> you know, I had somebody ask me, you know, they always ask about these small groups. You know, well, six months down the road, aren't you worried about heresy? So yeah, I'm worried about heresy. That's why I meet with them week in, week out. That's why I spend nine months with them. What are you doing with your disciple? Let me go look on the Facebook page of some of your folks in your church. And there's all kind of heresy on the Facebook page of folks in your church. I'm not picking on y'all, but I'm just saying, I've been around church enough to know you go to Facebook and somebody goes to church and you're going to find some heresy. And you're going to find some legalism. And you're going to find, you know, you're going to have problems. Let me just put it that way. If, if you're doing a small group, if you're in a church, there will be problems. Paul, greatest church planner ever in my mind. He wrote some books called 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, 3 Corinthians, 4 Corinthians. Now, we only have 1 and 2. Why was he writing all those letters? They were a problem. In the church. In the church. Can you believe it? The greatest church planner in history had problems. He had a man who was living with his mother-in-law. Okay. He had legalism. He had drunkenness at the Lord's Supper. Now, when's the last time you saw that one? So they're at the Lord's Supper and they're drunk. Okay? So I just want you to know, if Paul can have problems, should you expect problems? <laughs> yeah, people are messy. I'm messy. You put me in rush hour traffic in Charlotte, North Carolina, <laughs> you see some mess. Because, you know, I'm just, if I had a bazooka on my car, I'd just be cleaning house. I'd have one lane road anywhere I want to go. Anyhow, I'm... I'm, I'm, I'm a man, you know, I got, I got my own struggles, you know, and, I, and I, it's just, that's the way, we, we all, to a certain extent, you know, we have a mess. And when you're dealing with baby Christians, what do babies make? Mess. Yes. Messes. And what's mom and dad's responsibility? Clean up. Clean up. Help that baby. But what we're doing right here, the seven commands of Christ, y'all want this one. Seven commands of Christ. Seven stories of hope, that's like before they know Christ. Now they know Christ. That's why we added these little sidebars. Is there's, now we need, we need to make sure they under, understand and interpret the Scripture properly because we want the baby 
See, the sword method is what do you learn about God, what do you learn about man, right? So what do you learn about God, what do you learn about man? Theology of God, theology of man. This is, this is called inductive Bible study. So we're teaching them real basics. So we're putting a knife and a fork. Not a sharp knife, but a knife. Now you put a knife and a fork in the hands of a baby and give them a plate. What do you got? A mess. A mess. Most of it's on the floor. But they got to learn, right? They, they, now at first we got to pick up the spoon and guide it in. But eventually what do they do if they want to eat? They're going to learn to pick up that spoon. And so early on, yeah, it's, you know, that's why we bottle feed it first. Seven Commands of Christ is the bottle. You're, you're going to do this really simple. You're plugging the bottle in saying, boom. All right, here's what you need to eat. You need this. You need, you have to repent and believe in Jesus. You need to be baptized. You need to learn to pray. You need to learn to love God, love your neighbors, and love your enemies. You need to learn to give. You need to learn to take the Lord's Supper. You need to learn to make disciples. So we're saying there's some basic things that every babe needs. You have to have these things. But after that, we want to we want to put a fork and a knife in their hand. Well, what we decided is we put the fork and knife in their hand as soon as they became a baby. So they're drinking milk, but they're also throwing food all over the place. So that's where the mess comes. But you're preparing them to learn to rightly divide the Word of God. And so then, sin to avoid, example to follow, command to obey, promise to claim. This is just, okay, I heard the story. I heard a true story from the Word of God. I'm understanding the basics of the story, but now, why is my life going to be different this week? What am I going to do? Who am I going to share this story? But why is my life going to be different? So we want to grow the kingdom this way, but we want to grow the kingdom this way. I need to grow deeper in the Lord. But I also need to be part of the expansion of the kingdom. I, I need to be involved in both sides of things. And so, seven commands of Christ, and, and you can change it to eight commands, ten commands, that's up to y'all. Y'all say, somebody, somebody always says, well, I need one a lesson on the Holy Spirit. Put it in, you know. I need a lesson on the Word of God. Put it in. I need a lesson on, you know, uh, what is a church. Man, put it in. The only thing, as I would say, is stay between seven and eleven. Um, so, and then here's a, here's a guiding question. What is the difference between reproducible and reproducing? What's the difference between reproducible and reproducing? One is doing, the other one is trying to. Yeah, one is yeah. happening, yeah. and one I would say maybe is theory. Yeah. You know, like a photocopier. If I push the button and turn it on, and I mechanically get it going, what's it going to do? I'm going to get photocopies. But I had to turn the switch. But there's other things, you know, God turned the switch on something outside with birds and animals and deer. Man, I'm glad deer reproduce. That way I can shoot them. Um, and then eat them. Y'all like deer meat? Oh, it's good stuff. Um, but... He, he built that into the system of nature is reproducing. We are reproducing. He also built it into the spiritual system. God intended for us to reproduce. That's who we are. But the problem is that sometimes if I give you a good, I give you a nice book and I say I want all of you this week to go out and reproduce this book. <clears throat> How many of y'all can reproduce this book? Yeah, I'm, I'm not jumping up either. So I'm going, well, but what if I give you a simple lesson that says repent and believe? Could you reproduce a lesson that says repent and believe? Walk through a story, ask some questions, have a dialogue with somebody? And so, is this reproducible? Yeah. But which would be more reproducing in my community? This or this? You know? And this is good. You know? And, and now maybe you're somewhere in between this. Maybe you're working with PhDs. And maybe you could be at a different... All I'm saying is a guiding question is, think about your community. What's the average man or woman look like in your community? And would my material be reproducing in my community? If we made everybody do English 
in the Chinese community, not much reproducing. I mean, some would do well, young people. You know, they're very sharp and very good in the English. But somebody who's older, what do they want to hear? They want to hear Chinese. Because it sounds good. It feels good. You know, it's, ah, oh, it's, we call it mother tongue. <laughs> and that's what, you know, it's the word ta ethne. Ta ethne is the idea of mother tongue. But it feels, it's more likely to be reproducing that way. So, so this is good. But, again, what's the average person that you're working with? Communities I'm in, for the most part, semi-literate would be the average in our community. We, have, we, have, we actually have smart people, believe it or not, in Rutherford County. I mean, y'all think all those terrible stories we tell where there's, there's nobody. It's not as bad as it sounds. But what we're trying to think is what's the average person in our community look like? And what's the, so that's why we've used storytelling a lot and we use a lot of repetition is that's where the average person in our community is. Now, if I was at UNC Charlotte working with PhDs, yes, I might, I would adjust my material. But I wouldn't adjust the process. Okay? So, think about what's the average person in your community look like and what would be reproducing through the community to fourth generation. Fourth generation. Okay? Because you can think, I can pass this on to one person. But can that person pass it on to a person who passes it on to a person who passes it on to a person? And so that's the guiding thing. Reproducing, fourth generation. Reproducing, fourth generation. Can we get there? And, and we're just going to have to, one, if you get to fourth generation, it's a God thing. Only God would get you to fourth generation. I, I don't care who you are. I don't care if you're Clint Harrell. Look at how in North Carolina. He's about to get to fourth generation. Trust me. God put We'll put them in fourth generation, not Clint. Isn't that right? Is that right? I heard him say the other week, he said, man, he said, somebody else got saved. I don't understand it. <laughs> you know, they, they, they seven or eight people come to Christ, somebody else last week, and he's going, I, I don't even understand. I, I'm just, just telling these stories, and people are giving their lives to Christ. And, and really, it, it really, it's a God thing. So will your lessons reproduce to fourth generation and the goal is to get fourth generation. Okay? Yes, sir. You've got the, the seven stories of hope. And you've got the seven uh, commands. commands of Christ. Where is the transition? When when do you start teaching that? You, say in your in your in your group you've got three that are saved, two that are lost, but you've been together now seven weeks. And you've gone through all the stories of hope. You've got these hanging out here. Where, what's, the, what's the transition? This lesson right here. This repent and believe. If, if I shared my testimony and I shared the gospel and somebody said I'm ready to believe, I would teach them repent and believe. If I shared creation to Christ and somebody said, hey, I'd like to believe right now, 20 minutes later, I'd say, let me teach you this lesson, repent and believe. I took you through seven weeks of creation to Christ and on the eighth week, we're going to teach them this lesson, and we're going to ask them to make a commitment. Now, what do we do if they don't make a commitment? Keep working with them. Just keep discipling them. If they're still spiritually hungry, they're still growing, you just go, you're going to go through the seven commands of Christ. Um, and then sometimes you definitely have mixed groups. You know, Clint's had guys coming to Christ at various times in the groups. You just have to keep on top of, if people come to Christ, you know, one week, as soon as somebody comes to Christ, what's the first thing you're going to teach them? Who to share with and what to say. Their testimony. So you taught them repent and believe. As soon as you teach them repent and believe, teach them who to share with, teach them what to say. Okay? And so you got so you got a little bit of that going on. You have three, four different people at the same, you know, you're all on the same lessons, but you're having to add this in. And you're trying to launch them out. So, but... If I did the 10 weeks of creation to culmination, at the end of 10 weeks, I would use repent and believe. And if you want to rewrite this, I, we gave you a Word document. You don't like the way we word something, change it. You know, The only guiding thing, again, I'd say is think fourth generation and think reproducing. If you add so much into it, I had a friend, uh, Burke Wilson, we was with him last week. His gospel presentation had 73 Bible verses. 
It was a very thorough gospel presentation. But what's, how many of your new believers are going to be able to do that? It was taking them six months to train somebody to share 73 Bible verses. Let alone, I don't know that I want to listen to 73 Bible verses and get saved. He's got less and more. Less. Call on the Lord and you shall be saved. But in that, you know, and so we got Burks down to seven. And, and so now the exciting thing is Burks got seven third generation groups. And so seven groups with third generation. That's exciting. Because we're, we're starting to get to where that's, again, that's a God thing. And he's had a load of second generation groups. But the big change for him was, now he had good discipleship, good stuff going on, but 73 verses. And then I think he shaved it down to 20 some. He finally got down to seven. <laughs> but, um, you know, the question is how much does a person need to get here to get saved? How much do they have to hear? Now, it may vary from place to place, but give you an example. I, I was teaching at uh, Mid, what do they call it? Midwestern Seminary. Mm -hmm. And I had uh, about. 25, 18 year olds telling me you had to know that God was creator God of the universe before you could be saved. Um, and and I, it's good, it'd be great if you knew. I, I don't know that I knew God was creator God when I got saved. My dad was a theistic evolutionist when he gave his life to Christ. So I, I'm going, do you have to understand the Trinity before you can get saved? Do you have to understand sanctification before you get saved? Do you have to understand glorification? So what we're saying is let's get down to the essentials and what's mostly likely to reproduce in our community. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to take and I want you to draw out the four fields. Okay? And I want you to think about... We have, we're not going to talk about the fourth field. I just sort of... I feel like most of us in here are really going to focus on field one, two, and three. And we're probably going to use it for growing our churches and reaching our community. And so I'm not really going to, but I still think you've got to have them in some type of group. You know, you're not going to be really multiplying churches that meet at homes by any means. But we are going to try and share with people far from God, share our story, Jesus' story, and we're going to teach them some basic commands, and then we're going to disciple them to the church. But I want you to reproduce that four fields. But I want you to sit and think, I shared you a gospel presentation I like. But you probably have a better one than what I've got. What is it you would put there that would work well in your scenario? Because you don't have to use what we're using. All we're saying is, does that gospel presentation have the potential to be reproducing? Does this discipleship, is there something you look at this and you go, wow, we really need to change this? First thing most people do is get rid of the sword because they say it's violent. But anyhow, I'm not, you know, I'm, I, I like Hebrews 4. 12, and so it sort of fit a little Bible motif there is what we were thinking of. But um, Does that make sense? I want you to sit together. I want you to pull out and draw a picture of the four fields, pair it with somebody, and I want you just to talk through the idea of being reproducing. Um, oh, let me do one thing real quick. I want everybody to stand up. Y'all are getting sleepy on me. In Nepal, we call it botlagio. Can y'all say botlagio? Botlagio. That means you're feeling the rice. <laughs> when you feel the rice, you get sleepy. Okay? So we're going to do a Baptist dance. Okay? So I'm going to teach you seven things that Jesus commanded the disciples to do. And so it's like, I don't know if you noticed in that first story, Jesus says um, to Simon, you know, he said... Uh, Simon, I have something to say to you, right? And so Simon says. What's Simon say? All right, I'm going to say Simon says. All right, so Simon says, repent. Let's see, let's see. Repent and believe. Okay? you got to have a little room. Repent and believe. This will wake y'all up. Look, you're going this way. Repent and and believe. Yo, you got to talk while you're saying it. Repent. Repent. And believe. Now, if you, if you want to get real serious about it, you go repent and 
but leave. You know, something like that. Like, give a little football feel to it, you know? All right? So repent and believe. After you repent and believe, what is the first thing that you do? Baptize. <laughs> Don't shake that too much. So baptize. Baptize. Just do something for baptism. Okay? Out of this camera. Repent, believe, baptize. Do it without sin. Repent, believe, baptism. The next thing is prayer. Okay? I'm going to wrap it up at the beginning. So repent. And believe. And believe. Some of y'all are going, I ain't going. Repent and believe. And then baptism. Prayer. Okay? The next thing is we're going to love God. Love our neighbors. And love our enemies. Okay? And after we love our enemies. Oh, it's love. <laughs> you gotta love your enemies. <laughs> so you, so you love. After you love your enemies, you're gonna give. In, in Asia, everybody carries their money up here, so we give. Okay. All right. So back from the beginning. Repent and believe. Baptism. Prayer. Love God. Love your neighbor. Love your enemies. And. Give. 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 The next one is make disciples. Make disciples. We point at our watch. We're going to give time to our disciples. We're going to make disciples. Intentional time to make disciples. Make disciples. And then the last one is break bread. The Lord's Supper. We're going to do the Lord's Supper. Okay? So one last time, all the way from the beginning. I totally embarrassed and humiliated you. Repent <laughs> and believe. And baptism, prayer, love God, love your neighbors, love your enemies, give, make disciples, break bread, break bread. Okay, good. Now Clint's gonna lead us in this. Okay, well, he's just being too cool. He, you know. Okay, you can sit down. I, you, you'll have to reproduce that before you leave today or else you don't graduate. Um, but that's the seven commands of Christ. That's the seven basic things you're going to teach new disciples. Okay? 